Now, what that actually does weave into this next question I have, um, and it's interesting that you know we both use but also break down linear narrative. Mm -hmm. We seem to both be suspicious of it. I love that about your work. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, I'm you know I, I don't always write. Ex I'm not a hundred percent. Sometimes I feel like a fraud, even though my allegiance aesthetically is with experimental writers. Yeah. But I don't always go all the way. I try to use the power when I really have to, which mm -hmm. is really what you do too. You know, your subject mm -hmm. matters just require it, I think, more than um, mine sometimes. But so in this, in this book, you have, exp you have the experimental and all sorts of incarnations throughout. You also have fiction and nonfiction. You have point of view shifts. You have first, second, third. It's like all over the place. I mean, pages with just a single line. I really love this Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I mean, there's been great reviews everywhere. You can see 10 million of amazing um, reviews uh -oh. for Lydia's work. I mean, it's really, it's been heartening to see people, you know, really getting, understanding challenging work and loving it. It's been great. And I love this, this writer for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel writing that it, she thought of this, or he, I don't know, uh, this was a prose poem recast as a novel and calling to mind the late work of Virginia Woolf and Clarice Lispector's short stories while also slyly rewriting Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, which I think is a really clever and interesting way to think of the book. I mean, I didn't think of the Lolita thing. Nor did I. Right? <laughs> People bring to you interesting things yeah. sometimes. But I love this idea of also the prose poem mm. and so this idea of the different genres. And so you spoke on this a little bit, but. I guess I'm interested also, and I'm sure there's some writers here too, about your process and the idea of being an experimental writer, working in this, with, with all this different terrain. Mm -hmm. um, I'm suspicious of all the divisions made uh, in the artistic sphere. Poetry and prose being separate from each other doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I'm not sure it ever has made any sense to me. I've learned everything I know about image sequences and lyricism, and how to juxtapose images from poetry and poetics. That is the, that is the place to learn it, and a little bit from painting. <laughs> and that we don't slide that over to challenge and enhance and make prose more electric baffles me. And so I guess I decided to quit worrying about those divisions anymore and let them do what I feel they do. And I bet I'm not the only one in the room who believes this. Yeah. They're always speaking to each other and articulating each other and interrupting each other and remaking each other. It's, it's us. We bring the division to it. The market brings the division to it. In terms of artistic process and production, there is no division. And so, I also have an impulse to take things as close to the edge as possible, and sometimes I push them over and no one gets it or like <laughs> whatever. But artistically, I, I love the edge. Everything important in my life has happened at some kind of cusp. It doesn't happen at the easy, smooth places in life. It happens at the cusp of breakdown or grief or joy or you just lost everything. And so I try to take stories and writing to those cusps. So I'll take a sentence, a prose sentence, as close to the edge of sense and toward abstract expression as I possibly can. And I delight in that. And at a certain point, you're going to have to forgive me, at a certain point I stop caring about you as readers. <laughs> so I, you're all beautiful. I'm being punished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I del so delight in that part of the process that I'm willing to go over the edge of plot or sense or, you know, the story making stable, coherent thing to you. I, I would ma rather delight and play inside the artistic process of unbuilding sentences, moving them towards poetic lines, or moving a page of prose toward the effects of an abstract painting. I'd rather spend a year doing that than making the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody let me. That's the weird part. Yeah. <laughs> somebody looked at it and went, oh, this is a thing. <laughs> well, I think it's people actually can handle it more than we think. I think sometimes publishers 
Yeah, the wrong publishers, I think, sometimes underestimate the public. I always go on rants about the publishing industry, and I really think it's like a lot of editors who look down on what readers are capable of, you know, and... I agree with that. I think they can, because you, with this book, for instance, there's a gut there's a gut connection you can make to a lot of what might not make cerebral sense at all times and that's what you want you want people to feel this like here not always here and that's like when i imagined you writing this i mean i felt that it, you put a lot of yourself physically into yes. this if you don't feel something in your body when you read something i'm writing i feel like i'm failing yeah and I, I'm not quite sure how to articulate the rest of that to you, but it's what I work at when I'm sitting there making something. I want you to remember that you cry or that you breathe differently or that you held your breath or that you got angry and threw it against the wall. Yeah. That you are embodied. And I like to write into the embodied space of reading so that a book can happen to you instead of the more passive entertainment thing, which is also cool for different reasons but it's not my jam. Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, I actually am curious about the process of writing this, too, and the t time period that you wrote it, and like what it was like. I mean, there's been times where I've been writing where I feel like I was like wasting away physically because of the book, or like, you know, or someone was like, oh, you look like fit. You're in a diet or something. And I'm like, oh, I'm just writing all the time. Like, it actually feels like, I'm exhausted afterwards. It feels like I'm running a marathon, but I'm kind of curious about what the journey was like during this period. Was it written fast? Was it? I... No, uh, there were many stages. Well, first of all, when I'm writing, I, I get fat. Oh. <laughs> so I drink a lot more. And also, there's chocolate. <laughs> Yeah, you have to consume. I yeah, I was smoked. <laughs> Similar, I quit, but, yeah. but yeah. Uh, but process-wise, this particular book basically started off as a kind of Beowulf prose poem, an epic poem that barely made any sense, that no one could understand. And I showed it to my husband, Andy Mingo, who's sitting right here, the filmmaker Andy Mingo. <laughs> and he, he's like, baby? This is really beautiful, but it, it doesn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so he's the first portal always. And he literally helped me by asking me questions of story. Wow. And helped me tease out the pieces from each other so that I could take them on one at a time and see what was in each one. And I believe if he hadn't done that, it would have stayed this sort of, you know, a Jackson Pollock painting? It would have been a drip painting. And it would have been cool, but only to me and my son and my husband. <laughs> uh, so that was part of the process, and that took years, right? And then it went through the portal of a writing group I'm in. Right. And then finally it went through the portal of a really amazing editor and an agent who has the capability to be brilliant about reading literature and ask good questions and make redirections. And it took all that labor. It took all that labor. It took years. And it is a story now, whereas before it was that beautiful, pure, creative, chaotic vomit yeah. that <laughs> happens in stage one. That's yeah. what it was. And if I hadn't had that help, that's why writing isn't a solo activity to me. Yeah. I, I don't buy that. I if I, I hadn't had that collaboration, I don't think it would exist. I should mention I have a sort of voyeuristic obsession with Lydia's writer uh, group, <laughs> which is worth name dropping. I'll do it for her. But it's like Cheryl Strait and Chuck Palahniuk and Chelsea Kane, and it's like pretty all-star. They are. They're you big guys are pretty... writers, big in every sense of the word. and. Um, Sometimes I feel like the misfit in there. No. Um, I have my perfect. reasons, trust me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know them. Maybe Chuck is. Well, in a different way. But it's, it's amazing to me that you guys have this community and you guys have seen each other through several books. We have. And the, we're very different kinds of writers. If you know who yeah. those writers are, we are nothing like each other stylistically. We don't agree about anything. But when, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> 
if we drink later, I'll tell you. <laughs> but on the table with the pages, it's the work of making art. And so it doesn't matter who does what and what the different styles are, because we want to help each other. I'm being really generous right now. We fight a lot. Really? We do. Wow. But God. I didn't want to make them sound bad, so. They're awesome, and we help each other make the strongest work possible. Someone should do a documentary on that group. I have all these yeah, ideas. Right club, today. right? Yeah, yeah, the right club. Wait, this is we've come up with a lot of lucrative things here. Okay, I want to potentially lucrative. I want to go back to one thread from your reading earlier, and it was something that stayed with me as I was reading your book, and it came. It was this idea, the vocabulary. So often we think the vocabulary of art is so beautiful and so lovely and, and, and innocuous, you know, at worst. But some of it is very violent. And I also, not just when I was reading your book, but definitely the words shooting and capturing that a photographer does, or you can sort of substitute that for different forms of rendering. But yeah, shooting and capturing is so violent. Um, and it reminded me that I was obsessed, one of the things that inspired The Last Illusion for me that's not explicit in there, it's just epigraphed throughout, is a Robert Penn Warren mm -hmm. um, epic mm -hmm. poem, it's a sort of poetic sequence he wrote in 1969 called Audubon of Vision, mm -hmm. which I was obsessed with. But um, it's just a weird, mystical, apocalyptic sort of poem that kind of feels like it gets passed along people in this weird way, like it's hard to find but it feels haunted and scary mm -hmm. and, and just amazing. Um, but in it, you know, there's the portrait of Audubon, which fascinated me. I have a lot of birds in my work, but also this idea of just like someone who has to kill something in order to paint it or to study mm -hmm. it or to rent, you know, that was the big dilemma that Robert Penn Warren was obsessed with was, was Audubon's dilemma. That he loved birds, that he loved, you know, but he had to hunt them basically, and he had to bring them to stillness in order to render them. Right. And so this was in my head the whole time of the, you know, here you have so many artists are on trial here. You have the writer, the poet, the performance artist, the photographer, the filmmaker, the playwright, the painter. They're all on trial in a way. Could you talk about that in a sense? I think, why did I do that? <laughs> I think what I was trying to scratch at um, was the question of what are we as American artists right now? Who are we? Why do we make art? Can we say why we do it? What's the goal? What's the purpose? What is the effect of the representations we create? Because I'm so haunted by the effects of those photos I asked you about earlier. And you know what happens after the shot is captured and given the award? What happens to who's left or what's left? And how do they get back into a story? Or how do they get named? And I'm so haunted. You were haunted by that poem. I'm haunted by that question. Yeah. And so when I, everyone I know really is an artist. That's a line in the book. Everyone I know is an artist. It's true. I seem to have made a nest of my life with people, like-minded people. And um, I wanted to bring a kind of tension to the idea that we don't always know why we're doing it. And we may be doing things to ill effect and not thinking or talking about it. And we might want to wrestle with that question ourselves and ask if this is the art that is the meaningful labor for me in my life? Because that's a question I'm asking myself at 52. Is this the book? Is this the art I want to devote my labor to? And why? And partly it's because I'm in a writing group with people who have different reasons for their artistic labor. Yeah. And that question got shaken up in me. Um, and I don't have a beautiful answer. None of the characters in the book are very likable. So I confess to that right now. And I'm not sorry about that, because we're not. I mean, you're swell. <laughs> As noted earlier, you're all beautiful, wonderful people. But we all have all these different contradictory things going inside of us all the time. Yeah. No one's perfectly likable. Yeah. So I feel no allegiance to the desire to make a character a false likable thing. 
So all the artists are fucking up. But they have moments of glory and beautiful effort. And then they mess up again. And then they accidentally make something beautiful and do it right. And I wanted to show that. I wanted to amplify that. Um, and keep the question open. I keep saying this to anyone who will listen. It's more interesting to me to hold a question like that open, even for the period of reading a novel or staring at a painting. Hold the question open. What is it you made? What matters about it? Who are you? Yeah. What is it? Then to answer it. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. I Good. think that's a trap <laughs> of writers sometimes thinking that they have to be yeah, like providing Christine. answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is that I don't think that's compelling for anyone really. But it's interesting. I mean, I think that the thing about the, this, you know, this has been a big debate in the literary world. I mean, not even a real debate, but just a controversy about the idea of dislikable women or unlikable characters or whatever it is. It's sort of, the discourse to me feels like a low level of discourse. It's Very. not that interesting. I mean, all of literature would be thrown out if you couldn't in handle characters that you didn't like. But I think it's partially the influence of like millennial America. Is it? Well, yeah, everybody wants to be likable and liked and Click favorited like. and like friended and all that. And so people are getting a little like soft perhaps with this idea of likability. But I remember saying to a classroom of students, they were shocked when I said this. I said, all of you, someone doesn't like you. And for a good reason. Did they start crying? For a good reason, I said. Someone has a gripe against you because you screwed them over. You fucked everybody in here, too. You have betrayed people. You've been bad to people. You've cheated in some way, maybe not physically, emotionally. You've, you've, you've thought bad things about someone. You've been ugly to someone, legitimately ugly, and you were deserving of their bad feelings. And I said this to a classroom, and they were just like, I mean, they were. I mean, their faces went from like <laughs> disgust and like, you know, and like all that stuff. But it was like, you know, it took me a long time to get, you know, just into my 30s before I could accept that because I would just think, I don't know, why do these people all break up with me or why don't things work out? It's never me, you know. Yeah. Even though everything looks the same, all the patterns, you know. I'm, there's, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert has a great analogy about how she would, through her 20s, she'd be walking around just dropping matches. And then there would be fires all around her. And she'd say, I don't know why there's always <laughs> fires wherever I go. But she's, you know, so it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah. Um, I want to just ask you something um, kind of weird, but just kind of appeals to me as a writer. And so we'll see if this makes sense. I think we often have like pitches um, with our work, right? Like, our books come out and we have to learn about like how to talk about yeah. them, right? And which is really hard with, like I am at a loss for how to describe your book when someone asks me about it because it's like there's so many, it's kaleidoscopic to me how to describe it. Um, but we, you know, and I feel this way about my, both of my books and my second novel definitely where I would have to say things like, feral child based on bird boy of Persian legend <laughs> comes to, New York, Y2K to 9-11, and it would just sound so incoherent and complicated, and I would just cringe. But then I thought, like, the way we think sometimes as artists, there's, like, these other ways, words or objects or sounds that, like, are our works to us. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this might be an interesting question just because we we're talking about this, like, fluidity in the arts, too. But, like, for instance, for me, I see, like, colors. I see, like, a black, burnt... Um, glitter in my second novel, mm -hmm. that color is there. Mm -hmm. oh, I smell saffron and smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and I sense drowning when I'm reading it, which is weird because people sometimes say it's funny at parts, but I just see like, like a, a humor that comes like from last resort humor, like mm -hmm. a desperate humor. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe even a part of me sees that book and the experience of writing it is a little bit like a suicide note in a sense. Mm -hmm. So. But is there, are there any weird ways when you think of this, maybe even versus Chronology of Water, I don't know, what do you see or what are the, this is like a weirdo writer, no, it's, it's artsy, just you. crazy person it's just question. You. Yeah, you're just <laughs> I know, it is, right? <laughs> I mean, you're speaking a language that makes sense to me, yeah. but you don't get to just say those things to just anyone yeah. and have them understand it. Um, every piece of writing I've worked on has come from a non-content first place. Right. It's always come from um, images that capture my attention or haunt me, or 
sound or lyricism, if I get a line going that's poetic to me, I'll chase it. I'll follow it for pages, whether or not it has a story or content at all. I see some of you going like this, so apparently there's more of us in the room. <laughs> Yay. Um, and content is often just so subordinate to me because these things you're talking about, they're not just weird. They're elements of dream and subconscious and psychic material that comes to us in, when we're asleep. Yeah. Damn it, who yeah. thought that? <laughs> yeah. like, why do we have to be asleep to get the good stuff? <laughs> or in altered states. Right. Or, you know, in, in ways of being in an artistic trancey place. But that's where the art lives. That's where the emotions are. And that's where the beautiful stuff is. And I'll follow that stuff anywhere. Like I said, I'll go over the edge of a cliff to chase the tiniest image of one time I chased for 17 pages. I saw a woman talking to me um, about her husband having died and she was smoking and her hand quivered for like three seconds. Mm -hmm. I wrote 17 pages about just wow. that hand quivering yeah. before I got to telling that her husband had died. Because right. that was less important than what this did to me, watching it, watching her cigarette just like. So I think the, that's subconscious material. And for me, that's the more important material anyway. Yeah. Probably by the time I write three more books, there will be no story at all. <laughs> and I heard myself say on stage with Chuck in San Francisco, I want to write a novel that's an installation piece. You have to enter it to read it. <laughs> and I didn't know who said that. <laughs> I was wow. like, well, who is that that would want to do that? Yeah. Um, but I am most interested in those processes. And I'm really pissed off at how many of our institutions surrounding writing or art making try and talk you out of that idea. Well, try part of it, I think, is that there's a phobia. And I like this about you do this and I do this, but I think we're the minority. We're writers who call ourselves artists. And we talk about art. There's a very weird phobia in the literary world of sometimes saying that people are artists. And I know what they're really scared of. Like, maybe they think it's pretentious. Which also, it's like, to me, pretentious is practically a compliment these days. Like, we're not suffering from an excess of cultural pretension. <laughs> it's like, America in 2015 isn't that highbrow, you guys. You know, we could up it a bit. Um, you know, like Donald Trump, you know, I can keep going. It's like everywhere around us. So I don't know what people are really scared of. But also, it's like kind of crazy to me that visual artists, dancers, um, actors get to use art so freely as, as in their vocabulary. But we want to seem, I don't know, more butch, like, oh, we construct <laughs> things, or it's, you know, storytelling, as if it's like this really solid thing. Maybe because we all speak English. I mean, also, writing is also one of the only professions, too, where I think everybody thinks they can do it. Right. You're always, you know, where it's like, I wonder if, like, I would like to go up to a surgeon and say, I can cut a steak. So can I, I, let me try, you know, I can cut a body. But everybody thinks like, oh, because I speak, I can do it. But I mean, we all tell stories in a way, but it is like, it does involve this thing called art. Yeah. But people are, I don't know, phobic, writers seem to be phobic of it. And publishers, I think, see that as sometimes, bad publishers, see it as suicide to talk too much about like art or thing being artsy or well, we're bringing sexy back. I, th I think so. I think we. It is sexy. It Art is, is sexy. sexy. You know. I'm, I think so. Yeah. I, well, I'm, can I just ask one last? I just, I just want to offer you sort of a, maybe a gift to you because you've been traveling. But I just want to read a quote that sort of links here. But maybe some you'll have a thought. But like, who knows? You know, because E.L. Doctorow just died, mm. and that was like a, kind of a big writer for me. And he's a writer that I think people don't think about as artsy or experimental, but he actually was. Mm. I mean, he turned the historical novel into an experimental form, which is really should be his legacy. But anyways, um, he has this really, the end of his obit in the New York Times was really strange. It ended on a kind of cryptic note, and maybe some of you read it, but, but the author itself was kind of like flummoxed by this. Um, and he said, Mr. Doctorow could be inscrutable himself. So this was supposed to be like an odd tidbit to end on. But I think Lydia will understand this feeling because I understood it as a writer. And maybe some of you will understand it as well. So he says, Mr. Doctorow could be inscrutable himself. In writing a novel, he once said it was his technique to stand at a remove, to invent a voice and let the voice speak. Quote, to create the artist and let the artist do the work. Quote, the image I like is the one from cartoons, he added in an interview in the New York Times Magazine in 1985. 
you see the artist's hand drawing the little mouse. It colors in the jacket and the pants, and then it gives him a little goose, and the mouse scoots away down the road. Well, he said, the hand is drawn too. I love that. I love it too. It's so moving to me. But I think the author of this obit was kind of like, that's weird, a little <laughs> bit. You know, he's like, he's inscrutable. But that to me makes more sense than anything. And this is so big in your book because we see your hand. Right. You address the reader directly, I feel, at yes. first. Yes. And it's you. Yes. It's actually, it gives me goosebumps when you read it because it suddenly breaks that wall of the narrative that we're totally immersed in. We're in the story, but then it's like you come out and then, and we know your daughter, which isn't the same character, but then the whole, it's like the chronology of water bursts in too. It's really, you know, it is brave and amazing and revolutionary to read. I'm trying not to cry. Just a second. No, I feel that too. I mean, when I'm thinking about it, because it just was, it gives you goosebumps when you read it. It's important to me what you're saying because where I'm at in my writing right now is, oh, I hope I can say this without bawling. I want to make a bridge to you. And I want that bridge to be made of literature and art. And I do not like the cult of the author. I am against it. And I would like us to meet in the space of art or literature with our real bodies and make different choices than the ones we're making right now. I, my voice quivered a little bit, but I did pretty good with it. <laughs> you have to cut me some slack. And so that's very meaningful to me that you said that. Oh, I, that makes complete sense to me, too. I think we, we need that. For sure, that message is so urgent in this book. Um, okay, questions. Is that what we're doing? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Maybe you guys answered all the questions. All the questions are gone. Or no. There's one right here. Okay. Right. So, like, uh, what's your relationship with your body? Mm -hmm. There's an easy question. I know. That's an amazing <laughs> question. <laughs> can I actually, I didn't get to this question, but can I read Juice talking about the body? Sure. This is an amazing get quote. Get us out of the, this. Yeah, part. I know. It's, it's like an intense. <laughs> Quickly, I have a quote. Um, it goes, do not listen to what any society tells you about the body. The body is a metaphor for all experience. A woman's body, more than any other, a widow tells the girl, teaching her the history of art. The body doesn't lie. And I love that. And the body is a metaphor. All the, inter all the reviewers are quoting this. It's because it's just gorgeous and It's so good rich. for them. Good. Yeah, it's quoting. a good quote. <laughs> uh, um, largely, my move toward becoming an artist as a writer came from my experience of, uh, in the performance art community. And in the performance art community, also I'll admit in the SM community, I learned to address what is the body for myself differently than I'd grown up understanding it. And in the performance art community, I was able to bring my questions about, here's an example, what is this body that was the mother of a dead daughter that I don't want to live anymore? This grief-stricken body, this what I felt like was a monstrous body. How do I deal with this existence? And perf the performance art community helped me understand that very place of what I felt was physical destruction and grief and darkness was also the space of creative force and a place where meaning can change. And that's the first place I learned. I'm trying to thank you. That's the first place I learned that meaning is generated from the body in all aspects of life, and that is a creative place to go for destruction and creation 
always informing each other. And so I guess I'm trying to thank you for existing and doing the hard work of that kind of art. And I wish more writers could learn about it. I did, before these happen. <laughs> I did, I started off as that and I thought that was, I was, you know, Laurie Anderson was an early inspiration for me when I was young. And I thought maybe I was gonna be that and then the page just seduced me away is all that happened. I still love it. Occasionally you can catch me doing it. Well, you're naming some of them. Yeah, those, that's a good list. I mean, that's pretty good. I'm on the right track, though. Yes, you are. And look at who they read and who they were inspired by, and you'll find the same crumbs we found, you yeah. know. Jean and Reese. I, I, feel, you know, I said that in my blurb. She, I feel Jean Reese is Good Morning Midnight sometimes in here. And, um, you know, not maybe stall for a second so you can think some, but, but one thing, too, you should be heartened to know that we're, we, we could say we are experimental writers. Why not? I mean, I shouldn't be afraid of it, like the pretentious thing. Um, but but uh, we're in a, we we have a mainstream publisher, a major big publisher, Harper. You know, and it's like so that should feel heartening that this sort of challenging. And you know, other my publishers before that were, were were indies, but stalwart indies. You know, like Bloomsbury and Grove. So somehow we got an audience so it feels always like oh it's this dark alley of the weirdo fringe and it feels like but i actually kind of wish it was sometimes a dark alley. it kind of feels cool to have the dark alley feeling sometimes but actually what's what's heartening is that it it because i think that thing good publishers know that people can understand this yeah. stuff and respond to it because there's a lot that's visceral in our appreciation of art but the edge of the edges of culture are where things are most alive, so it's not yeah. it's the good place to be. Um, and even as you move toward larger publishers or more exposure, bigger audiences, I hope I never lose my my dialogue with and my relationship with the edges of life and art because otherwise I wouldn't want to make it anymore. But Kathy Acker Same. literally said something to me once that helped. She said, it isn't that um, you need to carry around fear about the weirdness of what you make. It's that you're not speaking loudly enough. And at the time, that really hit home for me because I was walking around feeling like I was doing it wrong. And her message to me was, you're not doing it wrong, you're being too quiet. Yeah. You know, wake up, woman. <laughs> and that helped me because I think some of the silencing we do to ourselves and some of the, you know, constraint we do to ourselves and really what we're making, we're, really what we're doing is innovating. And innovation should never be quiet. Yeah. It may fail and you may not sell a bunch of books, but it should never be quiet. Innovation is where life comes from. Innovation is where creativity is born. So if you're innovating, you're doing it right. Yeah, well said. <laughs> She's picking. She didn't see you. What about you? And then two more questions. It's hers at the attention. Yeah. Um, wait, was it me? Okay. I know you said you were able to, you at some point separated. Um, I'd also like to beg to differ. You're incredibly likable, by the way. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> in the world mm. and then the second part of that is also 
and you probably are aware of this, you have a bit of a cult status with the technology of water. You know, you do. And so have you um, let that go and not worry about, because really two questions. One, were you worried about how it was going to be received in the world? Mm -hmm. Like, oh God, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Vulnerabilities, how that could crack. And the second one, were you going to be able to separate from the chronology of water and what it was, and if you even want to separate from that? I get it. I, okay, so question one. I was terrified. Uh, I wasn't terrified that people would go I was terrified that things might get said about it that would discourage other people from trying it. That, that scared me to death. And also that I'd have to do things like this, which is be in front of people. <laughs> um, because I'm, I'm a a deep introvert, and so this is passing. You don't know me, so you don't know this. Um, <laughs> which is hard to believe when yeah. you hear your words. Yeah, well, Definitely. I'm old, so I got really good at passing. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you don't see the vomit part. <laughs> you see the, um, or what I have to do to get it going, and who helps me. So that was my terror around the material coming out, because I didn't want people who are willing to risk doing weird, cool writing to not try it. And the cult thing, <laughs> uh, I don't experience that with the chronology of water, but here's why it doesn't plague me or get in my way or isn't that hard for me. That book isn't mine anymore. It's not mine. But, oh, this might make me cry too. And that's right. And that's how it should be. Because when I see people who have them, they're all beat up and they look like somebody chewed on them. <laughs> and that's so right. It, what, it stopped being mine the second it went into the world. And therefore, whatever I'm working on next, that's where that energy goes. But I, it's not mine. And it's, it's, what, it's yours. And that, it, it turns into whatever it needs to be. And that's how I deal with that question. That answer might throw a monkey wrench into what I would ask. But um, Lydia, you've written uh, about how your fiction pulls a lot from your personal life, but then you, that, you know, but it's still under the, the framework of fiction. But then you wrote a memoir, and so I think I'm just curious um, how much do you put an emphasis on when you're writing the memoir, when you're writing fiction, on truth versus like subjectivity versus. Yeah, well, I'm going to say something over and over again the rest of my life without apology. I no longer believe in the difference between fiction and nonfiction. And I think it's a trick. I think it's a hoax. And to keep us in our boxes properly as good citizens of literature. <laughs> and I think what's more authentic is that fiction and nonfiction are eternally informing, deforming, and reforming one another. And so this is like the one question I know I have a solid answer for these days. <laughs> <laughs> and that is it. And I learned, but I, have, I learned it from writing The Chronology of Water and The Small Backs of Children together. And I actually think the two books have a relationship to one another. And they wow. finish the story for each wow. other. And they also raise the right questions for each other. So I believe that fiction and nonfiction desperately need one another to fully articulate each other. That's, that's my new answer. But it's interesting because if you think about the two, sometimes people think like, well, the anxiety about their differences really has to do with truth. But I actually think the anxiety about their differences has a lot to do with commerce. Agree 150%. That's the sneaky thing yeah. where they, they try to like separate them to make it look really noble. Yes. But for every artist, the two should feel linked. Right. But it's really, I think, publishers, those evil publishers, Except and this one. Except this guy who we love. Um, uh, but it's yeah, no, but it's true. I mean, there's a there's a whenever there's money in the room, things get a little sex or money. Things get a little. You heard it here. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe on that note, I don't know. I don't Do we know have time you, for more? I don't know if you know this, but in the history of the novel, like the first novels ever written, poetics and prose went back and forth with each other in the earliest novels all the time. Yeah. And it was, it was a thing. <laughs> and, and I love that idea, and I continually to harken back to it for that reason.